Well, hey, howdy, hi, welcome, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for stopping by to join me today. I really do appreciate it. My name is Ellie, and I'm a witch. Miss over here is my teaching assistant, Andy, and today is Sunday, and on my channel, that means it is Cryptid Countdown, and today we're going to be talking about the cryptids of Maine. If you are not interested in cryptids, or if you are new to my channel, I have two other series that I do weekly. On Mondays, I talk about history in a series I called Misheard History, where I take a history topic you may or may not have learned about in school, and I tell you the truth behind it. This week's topic is Ivan the Sixth, which is actually very sad. <laughs> But I also have uh, True Crime. On Tuesdays, I do Tea Time and True Crime, where I take a true crime topic, and I tell you all about that. And this week, it is the Bloody Bender Serial Killers. But yeah, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into talking about Maine's cryptids. So for this Cryptid Countdown episode, I am going to be starting off with the Medi Bumps Howler. Now I shall never stop saying it, every state has a unique Bigfoot legend and Maine's Bigfoot is the Medi Bumps Howler. Now it does make sense for there to be a Bigfoot creature in Maine as about 90% of the state is forest, so it's ideal for living and hiding in as a Bigfoot creature. The difference in Maine is that the description of the creature's behavior can vary greatly between encounters. Generally being described as a bipedal, large, hairy, part ape, part human creature. Though some people have said that the fur is very matted and dark, which is not usual. Some encounters say that the creature is calm and more curious than anything, while others report seeing very aggressive or territorial acts, such as throwing items or howling. These different encounters have led many to believe that it is not a single species, but multiple that inhabit the vast forests of Maine. Overall, there have only been 19 official reported sightings of any Bigfoot creatures in Maine, but given how inaccessible parts of the forest are, I would say that anything is possible. Next up is the Bildad. Now this is local only to Hurricane Township and specifically Boundary Pond. Now this creature is said to resemble a kangaroo, but has webbed feet, is only about the size of a beaver with a beaver paddle tail, and has a more hawk-shaped bill. It is said to only eat fish, using its tail as a whip to stun the fish who surface to eat bugs. According to Lumberjack stories, they are very tasty to eat. The only reported recipe was that it was cooked into a slingolian, but the person who ate it uh, lost his mind afterwards, so maybe don't eat them? Luckily, they are difficult to catch since they are small, shy, and can leap exceptionally well. If you do happen to catch sight of one, it will likely be crouched on the bank of the pond, watching and waiting for its next meal. Next up is Maine's version of Nessie, which is Cassie of Casco Bay. The first sighting was in 1779 by sailors on Casco Bay. Some thought it might be a one-off encounter from possibly drunk sailors, but sightings have not stopped and it is actually quite a popular legend. Old Mickelson in 1958 described the creature as being 100 feet long with a tail like a giant mackerel. Though Cassie has been described as being anywhere between 60 and 100 feet long, it is said to swim at an incredible speed, have a thick body, but color depictions range from green, brown, to black with spots. Sightings into the 2000s really just don't exist, though. Cryptozoologists, though, chalk this up to Cassie being smart enough to avoid the heavily traversed waters. Skeptics, on the other hand, say Cassie is not real, or at the very least is a misidentification of another animal, noting it could be a basking shark, giant squid, or oarfish. Next up is the Cherryfield Goatman. Now this story comes from Cherryfield, Maine. <laughs> it was in the 1950s when a local was driving his truck along the edge of the woods when it started to slow down and the gas gauge read empty. He thought this was strange as he had filled the tank earlier in the day, so he got out and was checking the tank, and when he realized it was in fact empty, he started to investigate if maybe he had a leak, but none was apparent. So he was confused and frustrated at the situation. When he turned around though, he was only feeling terror. He saw a man standing in the middle of the road behind him. Now he described this man as half man, half goat, or a satyr. The goat man simply smirked and sauntered slowly into the woods. The man immediately got into his truck, closed the door, and locked it. He frantically tried to start the truck, and to his surprise, the truck started and the gas gauge now read full. He took off and never had an encounter from that point on. From what I could research, there haven't been any additional reported sightings, so this is where the story ends. Now, some think it had something to do with aliens rather than a demonic presence or cryptid, but with no more information, we may never truly know. Next is the Spectre Moose. Now, the first sighting of this massive ghostly creature was in 1891. 
Now this original sightings was of a massive white moose by a hunting guide working around Lobster Lake. At first he was laughed at when he told people what he had seen, but a few months later a lumberjack saw the same creature. It then disappeared for a few years and was seen again in 1895 by a taxidermist. In 1899 there was another sighting, this time the person was able to count the point on the antlers. Now the average moose has between 8 to 12 points, while this moose had 22. With that in mind, the creature was clearly large. It apparently stood between 10 to 15 feet tall, weighing about 2,500 pounds, and the antlers were about 10 to 12 feet across. Now there are years between reports which has led some skepticism in it being a ghost or rather a real animal that migrates with the herd. Now albino moose also exist, though they are rare, so some think the sightings are just one or more albino moose in the area. It also helps that humans have a desire to embellish stories or just have faulty memories. Next is the Tote Road Shagamaw. Now, legends of this creature come from lumberjack oral tales dating to the early 19th century. The descriptions of this creature is a little strange. It is said to have moose hooves for feet, but bare hands, said to be as big as a horse, walk bipedal, and is often compared to a satyr. It is hard to hunt or find as it will alternate between walking on its hind legs and front legs, so it will leave two different sets of tracks as seemingly two separate animals. This creature is not known to be aggressive, but rather it is more of an annoyance. It's said to eat garbage or pets and doesn't so far have a taste for humans. Next we have wolfmen. Now there is a lot of debate on whether or not there are wolves in Maine. Officially there are not, but that doesn't stop people from believing or misidentifying animals. Videos like this have done the rounds with people believing it to be wolves, however these are coyotes or koi wolves which are around for decades of intermixing with the wolves that were once in Maine. There is a story from Palmyra about a small farm. Now this farm was surrounded by dense forest which the family that ran the farm loved to explore. One day when the father Eric and his son Sean went to explore, they both just had an uneasy feeling and instead turned around and went home. The next day, the daughter Chelsea and her boyfriend Nathan took the dogs out to the woods where they bolted. Once the couple caught up with the dogs, they were sniffing around a giant hole in the ground. Now this scared Chelsea and the couple took the dogs back home. It was a few weeks later that the next incident occurred. Now Eric was trying to get the dogs into their kennels for the night, but they refused to leave his side, clearly sensing something in the woods. Now Eric's wife Shelly was making coffee as she did in the afternoons when she heard her husband shout for her. Shelly peered to where her husband was looking and saw five sets of eyes staring at them. The couple immediately got back to safety, locking the doors and watching from the windows. As the couple watched, they saw massive furry animals come out of the woods. They would walk on two legs, but then run on four. Eric knew they couldn't be bears, but he had never encountered a creature like these. Shelly ran around the house shutting windows and locking doors, while Eric wanted to try to make his way to the barn where all his weapons were. When he stepped onto the porch, the creature's eyes all locked on him. He began growling and ran at him. He started frantically waving his arms, trying to get the motion lights to come on, and thankfully they did. This is when he noticed something strange. The creature stopped on a dime right before they were covered in the light, as if the light created a force field. At this point, Eric abandoned his plans of leaving and immediately went back inside. The family called 911, but the police refused to come out, so they were on their own. Shelly woke the kids and everyone grabbed any sharp objects they could find and huddled in Eric and Shelly's room. By morning, the creatures had left and the families felt safe enough to go outside and investigate. The only proof of the creatures were massive footprints with claw marks, which showed the animals walked on two legs. As an explanation, people have thought it is a type of bipedal wolf that hasn't been studied yet, or they simply encountered a pack of wolves that behaved abnormally. Now, wolves are much larger than people think they are, so if they had been poisoned or had a brain injury, seeing an already large animal walk on two legs would be more than a little bit jarring. Next is Wessie of Westbrook. Now, Wessie is a snake, presumably a Burmese python that was about 9 to 10 feet in length. Originally spotted in June of 2016, this snake was named Wessie of Westbrook. Those who are not familiar with Maine, they have very cold winters where the average is under 15 degrees Fahrenheit. After the first encounter, reports of a giant snake began to roll in and came to a head in August of 2016, where a massive snake shed was found. This shed meant that people could identify the snake definitively as a Burmese python, and the official measurement was over 10 feet long. The skin is held in the International Cryptozoology Museum in Maine as a testament of the research that cryptozoologists are doing. The real questions surrounding Wessie are if the snake is still alive, though it is unlikely, did the snake manage to mate, 
And are there any other giant snakes wandering around Maine right now? Last up, we have the Kwiwakwa or the Chenim. Also known as a white walker, this terrifying creature is sometimes confused to be a Bigfoot, which is why I put it so far away from that entry. Though people also say it resembles a wendigo due to its emaciated frame and its height. This creature is different though. It has no lips due to it chewing them off, a scream that will kill anyone who hears it, and the fact that its powers come from the lump of ice that has replaced its heart. Like other native legends, this creature was also once human, but it does depend on what tribe that is telling the story as to how the human became a creature. It can be through demonic possession, cannibalism, or through refusal to starve oneself. It is said that you can help these creatures become human again, and that it is a special medicine that you need. However, the recipe is not openly known, so you would have to consult the local tribe for help if you need it. Similar to the Wendigo, these creatures are most prominent in winter due to food scarcity, and they also have a hunger for humans. You can still find them in other seasons, or should I say they can still find you. They will disguise themselves by covering themselves in pine resin and then rolling on the ground, which ends up making them look kind of like a tree, so you can miss them if they are near. If you are able to get to a point where you can kill them and don't want to save them or don't have the means to, there are two ways to do it. The PG version is to force it to eat salt in order to melt its heart, and the not PG version is to chop it into tiny little pieces. A story that I was able to find about the encounter with this creature is from the Passamaquoddy tribe. Now the story follows a young couple who were just married and they set off to spend a winter together. Following the same trails as their tribe had for many years, they thought it was safe. The couple set up their tents near the river deep in the woods. It was a few days after they set up camp that the husband had gone hunting and the wife was in the tent when she heard stomping from outside. She was going to look outside, but before she could, the Chenu stuck its head into the tent and the woman was quick enough to cry out, Welcome, father! The politeness momentarily stunned the creature and the woman took that moment to invite the creature to sit by the fire with her. When she heard her husband approaching, she went to greet him and quickly explained the situation. The husband came to sit with them and addressed the Chenu as father as well, which pleased the creature so much it refused to eat them. The creature then began living with the couple for several weeks and they formed a kind of bond. The Chenu would help with hunting, the husband resting on its shoulders and he had an amazing vantage point from there, and the Chenu had even caught, killed off a rival Chenu that had come to attack the couple. Though the couple knew the peace would not last and one day the wife mixed together water and salt and was able to get the Chenu to drink it. Now, it did not kill the creature. Instead, it simply vomited out a lump of ice the size of a human heart. The woman then threw this on the fire. The creature then shrunk down to be a regular old man and was thus saved. And that is all that I have for you today. Sorry that most of the descriptions or explanations of these creatures was kind of short. I'm in big trouble finding information on a lot of these cryptids because there's just so little known about them or... You know, this just said, oh, they were seen one time, and that's it. And we have to gather all the information that we can from that one encounter. But also, like, Maine is 90% forest. To be fair, in my notes, I actually put 990% forest. It's not. 90% forest. But that's a lot of forest. To be fair, it's not a huge state. But that's a lot of forest. So, really, who knows what's hiding in there? Definitely Bigfoot. But yeah, this is definitely one that if I miss something or you know anything more about any of the cryptos that I talked about, please let me know because I I wanted to learn more, but they're just all of my sources were just saying the same stuff and I didn't I didn't have anything more. Also to address the elephant in the room. I dyed my hair black. Um this is the look going forward probably for a while. Uh, I've been dyeing my hair black since I was 16, um, took a break for a little bit, let it grow out brown, uh, dyed it red, like natural red head red, which is what you see in my videos of it growing out, <laughs> it's a lighter bit, uh, and I am tired of that, so I'm going back to what I've been doing for the last, like, oh god, hell, was seven years. I'm also filming at almost 11 o'clock at night, so I don't know if I'm in focus. I feel like I'm not. The lights are a lot. I'm doing my best. But yeah, the um, reason I'm filming at 11 o'clock at night is because tomorrow I'm going to Cripple Creek to film next week's Cryptid Countdown video and uh, Misheard History video. And so um, I, I need the time to do that. And so this weekend I don't really have much time, so I got to do it today. 
But yeah, enough about me. I hope that you guys liked the video, and if you did, you want to hit that thumbs up button. If you want to see more of the three of us, I guess, you want to hit that uh, subscribe button, and maybe follow Andy on Instagram. Can you stop? And for the rest of the videos this week, um, tomorrow I'm going to talk about Ivan the Six, which is really sad. Um, then I'm going to be talking about the Bloody Benders, which is also sad, but not gruesome. It is murder, but it, okay. It is not gruesome. Oh, your head! <laughs> but that is all that I have for you today. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.